when people look into getting voice lessons or vocal training, they say, oh, well, I don't want to do that or I'm afraid of doing that because I don't want to sound like an opera singer, as if becoming an opera singer just happens magically or automatically. So, Linda, would you talk a little bit about vocal training for the stage and why it's important to have? Anytime you are using the voice singing, whether it's Broadway or opera, it's a means of expressiveness, and you do it with the same instrument. Your instrument has parts, whether you're going to be singing Broadway or opera, and learning those parts, learning how to use those parts, learning how to coordinate those parts, the respirator, the vibrator, the resonator, the articulator. It's the same instrument, and so really, truly, there's very little change when you look at the whole picture of producing sound that you would need for Broadway. And so I would think that if you want a long-term career, and you want to stay healthy, and you want to have the most effective sound-making apparatus with the most bang for the buck, so it doesn't really cost you, and there, you're not singing on capital, and therefore you can sing for years, is to learn your instrument, learn how to coordinate it, learn how to use it. I take a little bit more physiologic approach to this. I hate to take the art <laughs> out of the artist, um, but from a scientific standpoint, too, I think of these folks as vocal athletes, and I can't think of any Olympic athlete that gets to the Olympics without a coach and a trainer. You must train the instrument and the muscles that are responsible for voice production, albeit respiration, phonation, and resonance, in an appropriate manner in whatever genre you're singing, whether it's opera, music theater, rock, <laughs> jazz, it doesn't matter. I agree that the muscles are, are the same muscles that are being used, although they may be used slightly differently depending on the genre that you're singing. Again, getting the most bang for your buck is what it's all about, whether it's in opera or music theater, because the reality is we pay for what sounds exciting, <laughs> and sometimes <laughs> exciting is not always healthy. Well, I want to talk about belting, because I was trained as a, a coloratura soprano when I was younger. But my first love is musical theater, waka waka all the way. When I would do what my, my voice teachers have always told me to do, for opera or even for singing prettily on the stage in musical theater, it's, it's like that's one thing. And I, I didn't have a teacher to teach me how to belt. I kind of tried to figure it out on my own. And one of the things that I noticed that was really different in belting was that I would plant my feet and I'd square my shoulders. And in that second, split second between the big inhalation of the intercostal muscles uh, opening up the rib cage and, and making the sound, that split second in between, I could feel my back muscles engage. But other than that, I really didn't feel a physical difference. Am I weird? What is belting? What are the mechanics of it? And is it safe? Oh, those are, those are <laughs> lots of questions altogether. Um, you know what? <laughs> the what is belting could be a debate in and of itself all, all in one show. Do we actually know what belting is? I think perceptually we first have to be able to define it. And as voice teachers, we are still not all defining what belting is as being the same thing. In my dissertation was on specifically looking at belting perceptually and then objectively. What I can tell you that we know generally about belting or what's reported is that it typically is loud, it typically <laughs> is it's called what we call heavy phonation, although that's not always true. My personal feeling is that belting is actually based out of the same mechanism we use from a speech perspective. And it's been my uh, feeling and with singers that I've seen, if they don't speak well, meaning with good resonance, good placement, and good breath support, they are never going to belt well. And if they don't know how to shout healthy, they're not going to belt healthy in, the mo in most cases. Now, you will always have those freak of nature instruments, just like you have those freak of nature athletes. And, right. you know, I said, you know, who doesn't think that watching Sean Johnson do, you know, acrobatics on the balance beam is exciting to watch? And I don't care if you're a decently tra trained gymnast or not, the majority of us may injure ourselves trying to attempt to do what she does. And belting is the same thing. So often we get into patterns where we hear a voice that we want to sound like or that you're potentially attempting to imitate, and 
sometimes those are the freak of nature voices because its uniqueness gets hired in musical theater and the imitation is often what injures the person not necessarily the fact that they can't belt but they need to learn to belt in their own instrument as opposed right. to mimicking what they're hearing or seeing that's kind of the short answer if you want a physiologic answer belting typically has a longer closed phase of vibration than classical singing just slightly and most likely there's a little bit more involvement of the thyroarytenoid muscle, which is the bulk of the vocal cord itself during mm -hmm. phonation. But not always. It just Every instrument is just slightly different. However, your use of breath and your use of resonance is imperative. And there are different schools of thought on how to train belting and some very strong opinions on that, <laughs> depending on where you are. Well, one of the best definitions of belting that I ever heard was a soft yell. And I thought, you know, that's kind of right. And it kind of makes you think, well, I really have to be careful about this. So, um, mm -hmm. Linda, let's talk about breathing and support, the idea of being able to have the power, have the sound go all the way to the back row, as well as vocal stamina to sing. Uh, the Several of the questions that I got uh, from people who could not listen live, but they're going to listen later tonight. They wanted to know, what are some exercises, what are some things I can do to build up the stamina to sing a vocally demanding role or to sing lots of performances? So what would you tell somebody in terms of support and stamina and all of that? Well, you know, I really don't use the word, I don't use the words that are overused and don't really conjure up a clear meaning when I teach my students. So I don't use the word support. I use the word lean upon ability and talk about the concept of lean upon ability. If you have that, you're pretty much not going to have strain. You have these intercostal muscles, these muscles in between the ribs, which help to open and close the ribs. And when you try to stay expansive and then you lean against that expansiveness with the muscles that are going to send the air up and out into the vocal folds, the, the vocal cords, and up into the resonation, if you have a good lean upon ability, then you can have power because uh, that lean upon ability and that breath pressure will affect either pitch going higher or lower and or volume softer and louder. So that concept of lean upon ability, which people call support, has to do with the, the, um, the staying expansive in the collecting phase after you've collected but before you've sent the air to kind of stay lean uponable and therefore uh, be able to have some command over what you want to do. The brain and the vocal cords have their own little, own, own little party going. So uh, <laughs> you can stay out of the way Absolutely. there. You can stay out of the way there and just think of that as a pass-through. You know, don't try to be active in the throat because the brain and, and the vocal cords, the vocal cords upon the, the, the command of the brain with whatever the pitch is will lengthen and, and become tauter or shorter and thicker. Uh, back to what Wendy was saying, um, of course, I, I totally agree. And uh, the thyroid arytenoid muscles are, are mostly responsible for shortening and thickening. But here's why, why classical training or having a really good teacher can help you, because uh, there's continual uh, changing dynamic of the stretching and thickening uh, you know, upon which a pitch or a loudness might be based or resonance or register. And you're going to use a thyroid, a retinoid dominant production, but the cricothyroid muscles, which are usually the head voice, they have to be well coordinated and remain active to, to keep the cords from over thickening or producing too heavily weighted a, a, a vocal cord. And so really knowing your instrument, sometimes it's guided by ear and then finessing the sound through the registers. Sometimes it's feel, sometimes it, it's, you know, the teacher will be the guide. But I just wanted to add that. And then, let's say we talked about lean upon ability and then, you know, training the muscles training the coordination really the rules of singing are so few but it takes years to have that sense of coordination and body balance and strengthening of those muscles and use of the instrument in a really seemingly natural way and it is natural I like to teach from utterance natural utterance enhanced rather than any sort of false way of producing
Do you find that in today's instant gratification society uh, and culture that people don't want to go into training because it takes years, or they've heard that so-and-so made it on Broadway or so-and-so made their Met debut saying they've never had a voice lesson? When I teach workshops, especially to teenage kids, I tell them, okay, hey, can you go lift that 100-pound box over there? And she looks at me like I'm crazy. And I said, well, no, you can't, but maybe in eight weeks. If you go to the gym and work with a trainer and you get a specific set of exercises and you do them repetitively and you eat right and drink water and you get your rest in between, in eight weeks you probably could lift that. And that the voice is the exact same way.